So, <coughs> there's Barbara. So, okay. What to think about today? What to think about today? Let's think first we're going to be here for this little hour, quick little hour, a few thoughts, bits of advice for how to live our lives in a more skillful way, you know. Um, so we're going to listen carefully. There's a nice saying, you know, they say that um, the Tibetans have a saying, you know, when you, there's, don't be like the three pots. The first pot uh, would be if you, you know, everything you put in goes out. There's a hole in it. So that's like in one ear and out the other. So don't be like that. The other pot would be a pot that's upside down. So nothing goes in because you're so busy thinking about everything else. And the third pot will be kind of dirty. I mean, you've got so negative. You're so negative. That's a load of rubbish. Oh, I can't listen to that. Oh, what are you talking about? That's nonsense. So try and have an open mind, um, retain the information. And uh, what else was the third one? Yeah, we'll have it go in in the first place. Then that could be useful. And if it's 1%, if you take 1%, that's good enough, you know. So it's always the same, you know, all the teachings from here to Buddhahood are contained in this two, this simple little analogy, you know, a bird needs two wings, wisdom and compassion. So I think, I don't know what we talked, I forget what we talked about last week, I can't remember. But um, the compassion wing is useless on its own, you know, and that's our big problem, I think, in our culture. We think of compassion as true, it's empathy for others with their suffering. But if we're full of our own neuroses and can't handle life and having problems and get depressed and get angry, and then how, your compassion's hopeless. It's, it's sort of obvious, you know. So, and, and our trouble also, I think, in our cultures, we, we tend to think well, we're born this way and we're kind of set in stone, you know, like as if we can't change. We don't have a sense that we're a work in progress. We know we're a work in progress when it comes to maths and music. You know, you can you can begin knowing nothing and you can become a genius at it. But we don't ever think that when it comes to becoming a, a wiser, kinder, less neurotic, less angry, less depressed person. We tend to think we're set in stone emotionally, which is, I think is a really interesting point. And this is exactly Buddha's expertise, that we're not set in stone emotionally. We can learn to change. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing static. There's nothing concrete about thoughts. Because in the end, all our emotions are rooted in thoughts. And that's really the key way that Buddha talks. You know, when we think about it, it's quite a revelation. He didn't make it up. You think about it and you can see it's logical. You know, all our emotions, the love, the anger, the kindness, the jealousy, they're rooted in being thoughts programmed in our mind. And where did that programming come from? Well, from us, you know, from us. Buddha says we bring it with us. But we're a work in progress and we can we can mold, as I always love to quote, we can mold our mind into any shape we like. This is really kind of tasty, you know. So it means we can become less angry. We can become more kind, more compassionate, more wise. We know it again with cooking and music, but not with emotions. I think it's quite fascinating. But that's the view we tend to have in our world, isn't it? You sort of you, you, you're the shape and that's how you are, what to do. That's awful. We're not like that at all. So the compassion wing, be, seeing others, having empathy for others, needs a clear mind, you know. I mean, that's what wisdom, as His Holiness says, compassion is not enough. You need wisdom. And even more bluntly, Lama Zopa says, compassion is not in Meaning well is not enough. We need wisdom. And what wisdom is, what is what you get as you, prog as you work on your own mind, lessening neuroses, lessening your depression, lessening your discontent, lessening your anger, lessening your low self-esteem, growing your goodness, growing your self-confidence, and therefore growing clarity. That's what informs your ability then to see others and to be appropriate with them. So often our trouble, I think, in our culture, we, compassion is something kind of fairly sentimental. You know, usually it's just for the little innocent victims, the poor little doggy, the poor little child gets hurt. That's about it, really. I mean, we're very limited in our compassion. You need to be an innocent victim. You know, we find it very hard. If we see one person punch one person and then the other person punch them back, we, we, we will ha we'll hate both of them. We've got to have a person who's a victim, you know. We've got to try and find who's the victim and who's the blame. We, we, that's our model. You know, but if we really understand our own minds, we're going to see that we're all in the same boat. We're all neurotic. We're all ridiculous. We all suffer from our own rubbish and we harm others as a result. That's a really powerful point. And I think this is, the, this is the really the basis. This is the key basis for beginning to have compassion for, the, for people who 
are the troublemakers, for the harmers. This is a very difficult point for us. But when we understand it, the logic is clear, you know? I mean, we love to point fingers. I'm sure we discussed this last week. I don't remember. We love to point fingers. What is it? Um, you know, the pot calling the the pot calling the kettle black. We all love to be like that. We love to look at the outside world and find fault. And we're probably right. It's not as if we're not right, but we act as if we don't have any faults. Everybody's like that. We're all the same. You know, we we're rather arrogant. We look at how dare those people do that. Look at that angry person. Look at that jealous person. We say, you know, like as if we're innocent. So this is why one of the most powerful um, components of our practice in the wisdom wing, the work we do on ourselves, the more we become, the more intimately familiar we become with our own neuroses and our goodness. We've got to know that too. But what we're trying to fix is the misery, the miserable bits, you know. You, 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 the first level of practice, you don't proactively work on becoming more loving, you proactively work on becoming less angry. And that enables you to become more loving. That's the point, you know. So you're mainly in the first levels of practice working proactively on your, um, on your neuro neurotic parts of your mind. So the more you become familiar with your own neurotic parts of your mind, you own them, you know, own them courageously, your jealousy, your detachment, your anger, your low self-esteem, you know, your impatience, whatever it might be. We've all got to join the club here. This is the thing I think we really, if we miss this, we miss completely the whole point. The Buddha's point is this, the Buddha's point is this, that what causes our suffering right here and now, forget karma, okay? What causes our suffering right here and now is our miserable states of mind. They're miserable, they're horrible, they're awful. So of course, as we know, we know they are, but we then try to point the finger to somebody who caused them. And then we say we, we're allowed to be this way. That's our biggest mistake. So once we can start to own our depression, our jealousy, our anger, humbly, and realize, yes, this is causing me pain. Yes, these are my problems. No need for guilt, just owning them humbly. The more we can see that that is what is breaking my heart. This is a really powerful step in our progress, you know, in our practice. We've got to recognize that that this is what is making me unhappy, my depression, my fears, my jealousy, my blaming, my resentment, my impatience. We like to find a way to get ourselves off the hook. Well, I'm allowed to be this way. If we stop doing that, which is tasty, then we can begin to recognize ourselves. And, and this is the point I'm getting to. Then we can see what makes us miserable. This is, this is what's causing our misery, these states of mind, these states of mind. This doesn't mean the world isn't a horrible place. This doesn't mean your boyfriend didn't be mean to you. This doesn't mean that people weren't mean to you. That's not being discussed here. It's looking at our own unhappy states of mind. And then this is the point now. Then anything we've ever done to harm anybody since we were tiny, anything, think about it. Anything. When you're a little girl, you got angry and you hit your sister, you shouted at your mother, you might have taken something that didn't belong to you. You might have, you know, said rude words to somebody. Anything we've done since we're little, anything we've done up until now, kill the ants, kill the fish, kill the cockroaches, anything we have done that has harmed sentient beings. It's very simple. Anything we've done to harm sentient beings since we're born, the source of it, where it's coming from, we're not discussing the outside world here, where it's coming from is those unhappy states of mind. This is so uncomplicated. It is so evident. It's so simple. But we complicate it by defending our right to be that way and blaming somebody else. Then we can never look at it. We can never, ever look at it, you know. So it's very courageous to do this. When we recognize that anything we've ever done, and we don't necessarily running around keep, we don't any of us run around raping and killing too many people. We don't jump on little girls all day. We're not stealing and lying all day, but we do do some things and have in this life. Then we, when we recognize they came from our delusions, our misery, then we can understand why other people suffer. This is the basis. If you don't get this, you cannot have empathy for others. It's not enough just to have compassion for the poor innocent victims. It's not enough, you know, because we want to find someone to blame. 
That's the dualistic way we have compassion now. So the more compassion we have, the more angry we get at the other at the other people. That's why we get exhausted, you know. We get angry. So this is a fundamental shift. This whole approach. So when we, the first stage in practicing Buddhism is knowing your own mind, knowing your attachment, knowing your jealousy, knowing your neuroses, owning them, not kind of, it's not my fault, not, oh, I can't help it, not, I'm allowed to be this way, not any of that. We've all got them, so we have to be very humble and courageous. Don't over-exaggerate them. That's as bad as thinking you haven't got any. Just seeing what they are, a bunch of habits, you know. And that they are why you've done anything since you're born to harm anybody with your body and your speech. It's so simple. It is so evident. It is so clear. When we know this, then when you see someone harming another, you understand where it's coming from. Their anger, their annoyance, their upset. It doesn't mean you, it doesn't mean they get off the hook because of it. You see, with compassion, we tend to think it has to be an innocent victim. So then we think, well, you mean I have to have compassion for the pedophile? So that means I have to think, oh, the poor fellow can't help it. You pat him on the head. No, it's not like that at all. It's simply coming from wisdom, understanding. So, okay, what is a person who's a pedophile? It's called attachment, people. Okay, you might have attachment to cake, all right? Aren't we fortunate? It's not, you're not born with the tendency to want to jump on little boys all day. Can you imagine the nightmare? Think of the suffering. Look at your own suffering of being attached to food. Look at your own suffering of being depressed. Look at your own suffering of thinking you're not good enough. Look at that. Look at the pain of that. Can you imagine the pain of being born and you have no idea why, you have no view of karma, that you're attracted to jumping on little girls all day or jumping on anybody or having any addiction want to watch video games for five hours you know anything we all have addictions of some kind it's called attachment we've all got our own trip you know we've all got attachment it's a question of the object so i'd be fortunate the best we can do is be attached to food attached to comfort you know attached to being kind of lazy attached to you know i mean isn't it at least we don't harm others well, can you imagine being born with a tendency to torture I always remember an interview with one of those serial killers years ago. He talked about how since a little boy, he was compelled to torture the creatures. He didn't know why. His mother didn't teach him. But this is the Buddhist analysis. This is what the Buddhist analysis gives us. We, when we become familiar with our own minds, knowing, of course, if you have the view of karma, that you brought these tendencies with you, and you're driven by them. I mean, look at us. We're all programmed to shout, yell get depressed, whatever it is that we do, our habits, you know. So when we can own our own, see how they cause me pain, then see how they cause me to harm others, then we can understand other people. This is the fundamental basis of the wisdom wing. If we don't get this, we have missed the point completely. And we can't have compassion. Very limited compassion anyway. This is crucial. But in our culture, we don't have that understanding. We want to be angry with the pedophiles. We, we don't have an understanding of why they're like this. We don't, we, we don't understand why. The pedophile themselves don't understand why. It's a habit, you know, it's just habit. We're programmed with our past te karmic tendencies, is the Buddhist view. He didn't learn it from his mum. His mum's not a pedophile. Nobody knows why. We can't work it out in our culture. We don't know why, you know. I mean, this little boy, since he's tiny, compelled to torture creatures. And this is the interesting point where we understand karma and the way happy feelings work. I think we discussed this last time, I'm not sure. But the, ten, the degree to which we've got a tendency to do something for, is the extent, to, whether it's good or bad, is the extent to which we have pleasant feelings. So the person who's a fisherman, for example, of course, in our culture, it's a very innocuous thing to do. We'd, I mean, these days, people like not to kill fish, you know, because we see they're sentient beings. But we don't have such a horror of it I mean, if we were like the Filipinos who kill their dogs and eat them for breakfast, we'd be in absolute shock. We'd be in horror. We'd, we'd put all the pieces in, we put them all on death row because we are attached to our dogs, you see. No difference between a dog or a fish. So, you know, this, if you're born in this life and you took the tendency to kill fish, the, sec the second you see the killing of the fish, you meet that scenario, it kind of triggers the memory, if you like, of the past karma, and it triggers enormous pleasure 
This is what happens. Pleasant feelings. So because we all want pleasant feelings, that's called happiness. You don't know why you feel happy when you go fishing. This torturer as a little boy didn't know why he felt happy feelings. So was compelled to torture because it gave him pleasure. We don't get this at all. This is all clearly explained in Buddhist psychology. It's fascinating. <clears throat> then, of course, because it gives pleasure, you, you keep doing it. So understanding karma also helps us enormously understanding why people think and do and say what they do, you know. Then when you see your own pain caused by your own ridiculous delusions, then you can see others. So, of course, you protect the person. You try to stop the person from torturing, obviously. I mean, I mentioned this many times. A friend of mine on death row in Kentucky, a Buddhist, Mitchell, there's a fellow on the Buddhist row whom I know. He comes to classes. I haven't seen him in a few years. Mitchell said to me, Rabina, he thinks of torture all the time. So something you think of all the time is called attachment, you know, and what you're attached to is a thing you're familiar with. So you're compelled to think it because it gives you pleasure. We don't like to think of this when it comes to torture, which horrifies us. But we're all just a bunch of habits. We're just a bunch of walking habits, everybody. Monkeys, dogs, humans, we're just a bunch of habits from having done these things before. So the habit you've got to do something gives you pleasure. For us, it's eating cake, you know. For this poor fellow on death row, it was torturing people. Can you imagine? No one who's on death row. Or this little, those other serial killer, you know, torturing these creatures. So then you can have compassion. So compassion is not weak. Compassion has got wisdom. Compassion is powerful. It is based on understanding why the person does it. And you won't know that until you know your own mind. That's a fact. That's a fact, you know. But what happens with us <clears throat> when we see our bad qualities, we get guilty. We beat ourselves up. Oh, I'm terrible. I'm bad. I'm hopeless. I'm getting worse. We should have compassion for ourselves. It's incredibly important. Look at the pain they are causing us. This is the point that Buddha is making. He doesn't, you see, they, they speak in such a different way in Tibet and India. It sounds like fundamentalism to us, how they talk. They sound like hellfire and brimstone. They sound like the worst Baptists possible. So we've got to reframe it so we understand what Buddha is saying, you know. Then we can have compassion. Then we can have compassion. Not just for the dog, but for the guy who kicks the dog. Not just the little girl who got tortured, but the guy who tortured her. Of course, this is too shocking in our culture. And there's no space psychologically for this in our models of the mind in, in, in the West. That's why Buddha's view is so extraordinary. You know? Of course, it's one step at a time. If you have been tortured, you can't just rush off and try and have compassion for your torturer if you haven't dealt with it yet. So it's one step at a time, you know. So I always quote the nun, that story about the Tibetan nuns. Repeatedly, I tell that story. Tortured and you know, sexually abused in prison for years. And at the end of their talk, these former prisoners in America, this is 20 years ago, at this event in New York. And there's when the end, one of them was sad and tears, telling about their experiences of being tortured and sexually abused in prison. And she said at the end, of course, we had, of course, we had compassion for our torturers because we knew we must have harmed them in the past, and because we know they will suffer terribly in the future because of their own tendencies and suffering. You know? So really, this, this level of compassion is really also broadly based on understanding karma. You know? It's a huge view, very, very different. But I mean, I think you can see in other religions, I mean, like in Christianity, there's incredible space for having compassion for others. You know, you have the view, you know, you have the view that God made everybody, God loves everybody. So I remember this one time, years ago, this conference in San Francisco that we ran, 25 years, 15 years ago, there was a, a, one little kind of group, two people, each of whose child had been murdered. One was a white woman, a Christian, happened to be white and Christian. The other one happened to be black and Buddhist. And they were discussing each of them their own view towards the, the murder of their own child, you know. And so Andre, uh, the fellow, he's a friend of mine and who works with people in prison in North Carolina, 
his son had been stabbed to death in a bar and this woman, her daughter had been raped and murdered, you know, by a couple of guys on drugs or whatever, whatever, some white boys killed her. So, and they both, they both came to, I mean, Andre on the first, actually on the first day, the, the night of the murder, he was interviewed by the local news on the television. And he was asked, how do you feel about the murderer of your son? And he said, how can I not have compassion for him? His suffering is only just beginning. I mean, that's just this life, you know. I mean, that was coming from his own experience of working with young men in prison. It was immediate and obvious for him. How could I not have compassion, he said. His suffering is only just beginning. I mean, that was so moving on public television. I was so happy that he was able to say that, you know. He was so moved by it. The first thing he said, that's incredible. That's exactly the point. Exactly the point. You know, he created his own suffering. His suffering is only just beginning. And he knows that because he works with these same young men in prison, you know. And the Christian, the Christian woman became a Christian as a result of her daughter being raped and murdered and then did her own thing and wanted to meet the murderer, wanted to meet the boy. There were two of them. I can't remember properly the story, but he too was so happy to meet her because he was full of regret and shame. He was on drugs out of his brain with paranoia. They raped her and then they decided they had to kill her, you know? So they shot her. And he, he told the mother, just before I shot her, she looked at me. She's a 16 year old girl, right? And she said, I forgive you. And God does too. I mean, that's just completely mind boggling, isn't it? She's 16 years old you know, before she got shot in the head. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, you know, you can see the human capacity. It's extraordinary, isn't it? And see, this is the interesting point that is very hard for us to understand as well. When you heard Andre talk like that, if you looked at Andre when he said that, you could see and you could feel that he was not suffering. He wasn't enraged, despairing, full of grief. I'm not criticizing anybody because he had a way of dealing with it. His heart was open because compassion means your heart is open. And this is the point in Buddhism. That's not called suffering. If you're enraged and despairing, which is normal, that's what's called suffering because it's delusions. But virtues, compassion, cannot cause you suffering. It cannot cause you suffering. It's not possible. This is a very precise analysis that Buddhism has of the different states of mind. Suffering comes from anger, despair, grief, not grief necessarily. Grief is a mixture of things. Rage. That's what causes suffering. Compassion doesn't cause suffering. Love doesn't cause suffering. Kindness doesn't cause suffering. The same with the mother. The same with that girl before she got murdered. She wasn't suffering. It's as bizarre as it sounds to us. She was full of love and compassion. That's astonishing, you know. That means they weren't suffering. Their hearts were open. It was just delusions that caused suffering. Anger that causes suffering. Fear that causes suffering. Attachment causes suffering. Love and compassion and patience and kindness and generosity and forgiveness do not cause suffering. This is Buddha's point. And we can prove it to ourselves. That's why Buddha says we can get rid of suffering. That's what he means. The first thing, the wisdom wing, is to get to see the suffering that your delusions cause you. Then you can begin to have compassion for others because they are suffering for the same reason. They harm others for the same reason. This is the, this is the logic. And your heart expands hugely and encompasses everybody. But this is hard. And unless we do the work in, inside first, it, it will never change. Your compassion can never grow, you know. This is the thing. So listen, you have to ask me some questions now. Come on. Anybody at all? Yes, Barbara. Yes, Mary. Um, there's uh, something that is called um, compassion, or compassion burnout. 
And uh, it's generally, I've heard it in the context of, you know, healthcare workers who are on the front lines right. of something every day. Exactly. Exactly. And is, is that, um, does that occur oh. as, because sure. the counterbalance of wisdom isn't there or i think it really is I mean, can, can kind exactly of right, barbara if you do the analysis and this doesn't it doesn't feel comfortable this type of analysis in our culture because you see we don't have the view in modern psychology or neuroscience that anger attachment jealousy and pride and low self-esteem are problems that we can get rid of we just think they're a normal part of a normal person do you understand my point here so the point is, if we have, we, you know, people who help others all day. I mean, I heard some, you hear some of the people working all day and helping others, you get exhausted. So you first of all, just get plain exhausted because you're exhausting. It's a hard day's job. That's one thing. But to get distressed and despair and to get, or to get, to, to, or, or to get fatigued, like you said, compassion fatigue, that's because of anger and fears and worries and anxieties and, and all those things. They're the things that cause us suffering. They're the things that drag us down and make us exhausted. Do you understand, Barbara? But that's not the analysis we use because we just think it's normal that you would be that way. We don't think it's something that you should get rid of or we just always sound like it's blaming us or something. But that's the reason we would suffer. Do you understand the point, Barbara? Or yes, I'm thinking back to when I was taking care of my mother who was yes. terminally ill. Good, yes. And there were just so many, there were days when I just, like I, I think it was fear that I couldn't do it or that I didn't have control over it. Yeah. And I, I wonder, I really do wonder if the compassion was the compassionate, the behavior of the compassion was an attachment. Like I was so invested in the compassion no, that's not exactly. that I wasn't. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Barbara. And the point is, you know, in other words, if you were a more high, let's say you were a bodhisattva, who's a person who's on this path, well and truly advanced, gone beyond ego, gone beyond attachment, gone beyond anger. And this is what Buddha is telling us that is possible. And most of us are nowhere near that. But if you can take a person like that, then you would argue they might get exhausted with all their hard work helping others, but they would never get it drained, dragged down, have aversion for it, get angry, get depressed. Not possible. And that's the thing. This is not how we think in our culture. So it's quite a distinct uh, approach, you know. So, yes, of course. I mean, I remember re just recently somebody wrote and said she talked about how she helps people, but she has such aversion. She can't even bear the thought of the, her clients ringing her and talking. She has incredible aversion, which is meaning anger. She pushes it away. So this is really how we all are, you know. I mean, I meant when you hear about some of the nurses who in the hospitals who during COVID who killed themselves out of such depression and sadness and hopelessness because we don't know what to do, you know. We, we would never do that just with compassion. Again, this is a really specific Buddhist point. Of course, there's attachment there, darling. And would there be aversion to it and all the anxiety? That all comes from attachment. Of course it does. But it's hard to be any other way. This is who we are. That's why it's important to know our mind very well and, to, and then to protect ourselves and be appropriate, you know, to know what we need, what we can and can't do, to know our capacity. That's really important. Thank you, Barbara. So helpful. I mean, Thank Vanessa you. must know about that. Are you still working in the hospital, Vanessa? Yes, I do. So you yeah, recognize what Barbara's saying, yeah? Uh, yeah, you know, you just don't get attached to the patients or, I mean, which is easy because they're not your family, but. but you can still be loving and kind, can't you? Not oh, yeah. Not yeah. yeah I, I, I think it's easier to care for them um, when you're not attached. Yes, that's a good point. That's a very good point. That's really the point in a sense, Barbara, because when it's your own mum, it's really hard, isn't it? Of course it is. So it's, that's very true, Vanessa. That's a good point, actually. That's really showing the point, actually. That's a very good point. Thank you, Vanessa. That's really good. So what else, people? Anything else? Yes, Lou. Um, today in Texas, there was a school shooting. Yeah. And some third, fourth, and fifth graders uh, I think the count is up to 15 now that were killed. Oh, Jesus God. And when I heard it, I, I was overcome with so much grief and everything. And I, I can almost do the analysis, but what, mm. what keeps on hitting me over the head is the amount of time between now and when I'll be able to do something about it. I hear that. I hear that. I hear that. You know, I it's like that. I hear that. I'm on the path of. That's right. doing I, something but it's right. such a long time that's right. exactly i know i hear that lou and, that's and i have hard time dealing with that yeah i hear that lou i hear that i hear it i hear it i hear it exactly so you know this is where 
you know, I don't know. I mean, it's like if I, that's why you have to look, all you can do is look at examples. Because even if you were a Buddha, no, look, look at his holiness the Dalai Lama. He's said to be a Buddha, right? I don't know, but he's said to be a Buddha. But nevertheless, look. It's, it, it, don't think that when you're a Buddha, suddenly you can make it all go away. No, you've got the power to do all kinds of things. But the point is, that it's the key to it is his perseverance. So if you look at the Dalai Lama and if he's said to be a Buddha, he can't just magically make all the, the Tibetan problems go away. But what that's, but, but what that's, what at least the quality we see is this unstoppable, um, enthusiastic perseverance. For, since he's 16 years old, when he was appointed to take over running the country, he's now 86, you know. So for 70 years, he literally has not stopped. And this is the point, even when you are a Buddha, you are qualified. And of course, we have to remember that you're able to manifest in countless bodies, blah, 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 blah. But it's like, it's it, the thing, all we can do is learn from that and know you've got, either you get dragged down and give up or you persevere. And that perseverance is a pretty stunning kind of quality because in the face of the nightmare that we see every day, to, to think, well, I've got to just keep moving and keep developing. I mean, the only, the thing that it does for us is that you don't despair. It's the only way to say it. It will take a lot. I mean, this is the point. This is the enthusiasm we have to have. There's no other choice, in other words. There's no other choice about it because despair is no choice. There's no option. So, of course, it's difficult. I'm just talking. I'm just talking, Lou. I, I agree no, with you. I, I, I hear you, too. Um, the despair is, is, is temporary. It, it'll go away. And okay, you're right. Enthusiastic okay. perseverance. Yes. We'll it's just that. I know. It happens so often that, you know, it's like. You know, and, this, and, this, and because of the inertia in this country, I'm, I'm not, I don't know what the solution is, you know, but it keeps happening. It keeps happening. It keeps happening. And one day there has, we're hoping that one day the straw will break the camel's back and there'll be some political will to do something. That's the part that's so overwhelming, isn't it? It just keeps happening. It just keeps happening. And that's just one tiny example of it just keeps happening. There's only one example of the gun business. It's not the only one. I mean, everything just keeps happening as long as there are delusions. So, yeah. So then, okay. So just, yeah, I understand, Lou. You're exactly right. There's no quick answer, but you, you know the answers. So just, I do. In, in other words, this is the one about when, and this is where, this is where, this is where the, if you take the view of karma and you take the bodhisattva view, then every time, like in the, whether it's in the hospital or whether it's this type of thing, every time you see the suffering, you know why it's happening. You recognize the delusions in yourself. And then it, all it can do is just reinforce your wish to never give up. That's it. That's all we can do with it. It's kind of for the, you know, to make it grist for our mill that's the main thing to and to increase our compassion not to overwhelm us of course they're the words they're the words for it lou so how many Thank children you, ben, are, how old were these children i didn't read the news yet how old were three fourths and third fourth and fifth grade how old was that seven eight and nine i think 15 of them oh jesus god it's unbearable who killed them do we know an 18 year old child oh jesus god a boy probably yeah a white boy, probably. Yeah, I, I have no probably. idea it's, it's all, it's how so much shocking. suffering he must have been going know, through. To, yeah. That's the point. But it's always this one category of people that do all the shooting. I mean, we think it's the Asians and we think it's the black people. We think it's this one and the, that one and the terrorists and the Arabs. But I'm sorry, Americans can't bear the fact that it's their white boys. And I'm sorry to be horrible here. Need 99%, isn't it? It's so tragic. Was he a white supremacist or just out of his brain? Oh, no. It's unbearable, isn't it? It's unbearable. It's true, it's unbearable. And this is where there's no point in getting angry. There's no point in talking about it only at the level of politics. There's no point. There's no benefit. But, I mean, at least the, if the political one can bring some will to make things shift, but then it does for a while, and then it sinks back into inertia again, doesn't it? It's quite a powerful one in this country. It's quite a powerful one in this country. It's very fascinating, isn't it? It's very fascinating. Unbearable, my God. Well, thank you, Venerable Bean. I just needed to get that out. Right, That's all. I understand that exactly. It's so important. Yes, sweethearts. What else is there, people? Anything else?
Yes, I have a question. Um, So recently, um, my younger brother just told me that he doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about family, and it's just oh, your poor uh, brother. Oh God, (laughs) you know, so hurt. Oh my God. Yeah. And I, you know, I was confused on how to react. I wasn't, you know, I I wasn't mad, but I was like shocked and I cried a little and then I was like, okay, whatever. But I, how would a Bodhisattva react to that? I mean, would they react to joy or? I mean, no, but what first triggered it? What happened? Was there a fight and something came Um, out? I would trigger it. Out of the blue or what? I was upset that he wasn't helping me clean up this house that my mom left behind, which so much junk, like he would just rather go somewhere else and, you know, leave me alone to lift all this heavy furniture around. Then what happened? And, you know, he's, he, I, I snapped, well, I, I kind of snapped and then he, he snapped back. He's like, I don't give a rat's ass about this house or this family. And when mom died, you know, I, you know, I knew when mom, after mom, I, I, I told myself when mom died, then I wouldn't care about this family anymore because she raised us to be different and not care about each other. And you, you didn't you didn't see this part of your brother before. I always thought that he was a brother, like, you know, supportive and always there for me. And but so it's he, quite shocking. So then I think the only way to respond there is to be so shocked that his mind is so unhappy. That's the, probably the main thing. I mean, you said you didn't take it personally because it was so extreme, wasn't it? So clearly the, the, he's got an unhappy mind, full of anger, paranoia, resentment, hurt. I mean, that's really shocking, isn't it? So then all you can do is have compassion for him. I mean, what else can you do, you know? I mean, he's the one who's suffering. It's pretty clear, isn't it? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just feel like, you know, it's like, he doesn't see me as family. And he told me, you know, if, if I had a wedding, I wouldn't invite you. <laughs> So it's, it's, I, I was just really shocked that he would say something like that That's right. because I, you know, I pretty much raised him because we didn't have, we both didn't have our dads in our life. So I thought, you know, he had a lot of respect for me for raising him, but apparently so from your side, it must be quite hurtful. It must be unbelievable. Yeah, it was very hurtful. I'm sure it is darling. Unbelievably hurtful. How old is the poor boy? Um, he's 20, he's I think 27. Oh, he's a man by now. When wow, he, that's really deep inside him, and it all came out. That was quite shocking, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I yeah. I I don't know if it's because he's just lived a really easy life and had everything handed to him. No, know. it's his mind, sweetheart. Lots of anger, lots of anger, kind of uncaring. But it should come out so rough. It's really tough for you when you've taken such good care of him. My God. So after you get over the hurt, if you can have compassion for him, because clearly that comes from an unhappy mind, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. I mean, if you were a happy human being, you couldn't have said that, right? Do you understand my point? Mm-hmm. Do you understand my point, Vanessa? I do, but you know, it's like my mind was kind of going to the territory of did I do something wrong? Well, or- you take it pretty personally. Of course you would. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Clearly, you didn't do anything wrong, darling. My goodness. I'm so sorry. Wow. And you haven't spoken since. Or has he got uh, over it? We we talk and but he says that it's our, our relationship is just purely business. My God, he's really upset, isn't he? He's really upset. I'm just confused, you know. I, I was, I'm still in shock. I, I believe you, darling. I understand. I hear it. I hear it. Quite shocking. I agree with you. So try and just protect yourself from him. And I don't know what to say. Yeah. It's shocking, Vanessa. Yeah, I just, you know, I think what because it kind of surprised me. It's like I would think that with my mom gone, we would be closer, but it was Exactly. Like, oh, you would have hoped for that. You yeah. would have hoped for that, yes. Hmm. So I just feel like he... You know, I'm alone in this family now, but I mean. It's only the two of you, wasn't it? Well, we have an older brother, but he's, they, they pretty much, I mean, my family, my brothers don't care. <laughs> wow. So it's a big learning for you, Vanessa. Mm-hmm. My goodness. As well as heavy lifting. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. for that. I'm sorry, darling. You just take care of yourself. All right. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Good, darling. Hello there, Sergio. Talk to me. Hello. Is it pretty straightforward to know where one's suffering comes from? To, do you have to analyze it in depth, or is it? I mean, is it pretty clear? Or, or and if if it is clear, uh, or sorry, if it's unclear, is it just one not paying attention to it, or, or what? I think it? it's okay. The th- it's like anything, you know. You got you got to learn the theory first. So the Buddhist theory is Buddhist view is that these unhappy states of mind, which are distorted 
and aren't accurate in their assessment of things that are eye based, that are fear based. These are the source of our pain. And these are why we harm others. Like, for example, Vanessa's brother, every word he just then said is an evidence of anger, resentment, bitterness arrogance. I mean, you just tick the boxes, Vanessa. So, you know, it's like, it's pretty clear. You say that that's the theory, but then of course, I think the job says you're getting to know our own mind is pretty, pretty intensely difficult because we haven't analyzed it like this. We've got a really, it's a slow process of unpacking and unraveling your own thoughts and feelings and emotions and trying to work out why we suffer. It's quite an intense job. It takes time. Do you understand? Yeah. Thank you. Slow process, you know, who else, people? But the key thing is having at least the confidence that it doesn't define us. This stuff doesn't define us. And of course, for Vanessa, the main thing for you, darling, is getting over your own sadness, your own hurt. That's pretty big, isn't it? It's so shocking that your should, brother should respond this way. When you've got a bit of space, you'll be able to see, you know, that um, clearly he's the one who's crazy. He's the one who's suffering. Do you see my point, Vanessa? I mean, to act like that, to speak this way is so shocking. Once you get past your own hurt, I mean, he has to be, he's like, that's almost like you could argue he's mentally ill. That's right. Quite, it's quite extreme. And as you said, it's quite, it was, it came out of the blue. You know, you didn't see this in him before. So there's some anger there that's quite incredible, isn't it? Do you see what I'm saying, Vanessa? And forget him seeing he's suffering. He has no idea that he's suffering. And if he thinks he's suffering, you're the blame. His mum's the blame. Everybody else is the blame. That's the trouble. That's what prevents us from seeing our own mind, you know? Wow, that's intense, Vanessa. So, yeah, anyway, slowly, slowly we have to unpack this mind of ours. It's quite hard. And to even get to the point of recognising our own states of mind is already difficult in our culture. I mean, shockingly enough, as Amos Opa said, the vast majority of humans on this planet have absolutely no idea that what goes on in their mind plays any role at all in their life. In other words, Vanessa's brother, based on what she said that he said, he would be a perfect example. He is he's completely convinced that his mother and Vanessa and whoever else are the cause of all his suffering. He is utterly convinced of that analysis, but that's the world. So he has no idea. Not only does he not know that what goes on his mind plays a role in his own suffering, he doesn't even know what goes on in his own mind. This is the tragedy. This is normal human behavior, you know, that's so heartbreaking. It's quite intense. What else, people, before we finish today? Time gone so quickly. 20 minutes yet. What other points, dearest people? <clears throat> so yeah the wisdom wing and the compassion wing and that's exactly the point you see vanessa's example her brother really hurt her really and the first vanessa thinks of course is what did i do wrong you know that's the first thing we think of because what have i done wrong someone abuses you the first thing that arises is fear and panic and then what have i done wrong you know and then when we realize we did nothing wrong then we get angry confused especially with your brother who she, as she said she's literally brought up it's very fascinating i mean did you used to get angry with him vanessa were you like a tough mummy or you yeah i was i was pretty yeah disciplinary because my mom was never there so i mean it was it was frustrating raising him so you literally were his mum. Yeah. Why was your mum not there? Because she works long hours. She was a workaholic. I see. How interesting. So yeah, so, but I mean, still you okay, put it okay, put it this way, Vanessa. He has clearly got his problems, isn't it? It's clear. It's evident by his words. But then always, if we're brave enough, always the thing we should do is think, because let's say he accused you of something. The first thing, if we can be brave enough, is think, well, is that true? Did I do something wrong? And if you did do something wrong, then you, you, you accept it, you recognize it, and you try to fix it. If you didn't do something wrong, then clearly he's the one with all the problems. So, I mean, this is a, a, obviously it's a good exercise for you to see if you did do anything wrong, if you were maybe too tough. But on the other hand, your being the way you are isn't the main cause of what he is. He is the main cause of what he is. You understand what I'm saying, Vanessa? Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. My goodness. 
What else, people? Something else, anybody? Things to talk about? Questions to ask? And again, Vanessa's point, I mean, once we get over our own hurt, but you've got to deal with your own stuff first, Vanessa, then when you have, then you can afford to look at him objectively and have compassion for him. Can you understand that theoretically, Vanessa? Or not? Um, say that again. I missed it. No, okay. First of all, there you are, a brother. He's really abused you, insulted you, criticised you, showed he has no interest in you, which is shocking. So first of all, you've got to get over your part of the pain. You've got to deal with your own mind. So at some point, when all of us, when this happens, when we get hurt by others, at some point we've kind of healed our own part of it, then there's the opportunity, if you can, to realise, to have compassion for him. Can you understand theoretically? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. I mean, he is the one who's clearly suffering. This is pretty evident, isn't it? He is, even though it's brutal and unkind what he said, but this is exactly the point I'm making from the very beginning, that when you understand your mind and you understand if ever you've ever done anything wrong to harm another, it's come from your own anger, your own resentment, your own hurt, then you know now why he is doing it because it's coming from his anger and his resentment and his hurt and his paranoia and his anger, aggressive or whatever it is in his mind. Do you understand what I'm saying? But we've got to deal with our own stuff first, you know. That's the point. Then we can help others. Then we can be of benefit to others. Then we can have compassion. We can't just rush in too quickly and have compassion if we haven't healed our own part of it, you know. That's really important. I mean, for whatever reason, you know, Andre was capable on the night his own son was murdered how can I not have compassion for the murderer? His suffering is only just beginning. I mean, that's pretty exceptional, you know, when your own son has been stabbed to death. That shows out Andre's mind. He had extraordinary, he could have compassion for this boy. He could see objectively this boy, you know. So it's a very interesting example. But if you can't have that, if your son has been stabbed to death, if you can't yet have compassion, don't rush it, please, excuse me. We've got to know what we're capable of. We can't rush ahead of ourselves. We can't just all be kind of theoretical. It's got to be real, you know. It's got to come from, we've got to work on our own mind one step at a time. So Vanessa has to work on her own hurt and her own upset before she thinks about her brother at all. Well, sweetheart, I don't know what else to say. Venerable, I have yes. something. I So just... Not to harp on, you know, the event today, but oh, uh, that's I know too. that I know that, you know, to help my own suffering, I, I need to be generating compassion for the perpetrator as, oh. you know, as best that I can. And uh -huh. as soon as I can, because, um, just as, as we're talking about, you know, um, the, the more compassion I have, the less I'm going to suffer. And I, okay, the more I angry have, you have, have the more But the I thing is also interesting. Greater. So it's, it's very, uh, yeah. it's, it's just uh, very relevant to, I mean, it, it's, it's really, um, you know, like Lou said, it's, it's exactly. But I, exactly. But I think what's interesting, we can talk about that here because it's the framework we're discussing it in, but for you to suddenly talk about that to your friends and the, in, in your, in your, you know, your people at work or your, somebody else, oh yeah, you should have compassion for the guy who killed the children. That's too much for most people. They'd be just think you're crazy. You know, some, you've got to be very skillful who you would say that to. Do you understand what I'm saying, Greg? I do. I do. Because most um, people just, it's just anger or, I mean, sometimes because he's a kid, I mean, he's 18, you know, people might, just but i think it just kind of confuses us we don't know i mean the and i think the grief for the parents and the grief for the families and the community and the school will be so overwhelming you can't begin to think about anything but just rage towards this boy isn't it That'll yes it, it seems like like the grief is almost attached to the rage you know and i and it the separate i need to separate that you know me grieving for those children um does not uh, mean yeah, for you objectively myself. that's good but i'm talking about we have to have a kind of a sensitive awareness of the of the family and the community and the people close to those children. I mean, it can't it can't even find the words for their feelings, you know. So we personally, as part of our practice, can think like this, but one would be very skillful before one would say those things to other people. Are you seeing what I'm saying, Greg? Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Well, sweethearts. 
I don't know, we can finish early. It doesn't matter. Maybe it's too much tonight. Maybe there's too much suffering tonight. <laughs> Maybe we've got to think about it. I don't know, just to say to you people. Maybe we'll do a five minute little meditation, okay? Just watch our mind. So just um, see if we can do this. It's a little bit of Maha Mudra. So you just sit, close your eyes, be very relaxed, very natural. And simply, if you can, the, the key thing is our thoughts are going all the time, aren't they? So especially, let's say, Vanessa's example, her brother, it stirs up lots of thoughts inside and we can't stop the thoughts. And this unbearable suffering of all these children dying in Texas and all the rage and the upset and the confusion that arises. So those thoughts are going to come. So the key thing in this practice is to simply, it's a feeling of stepping back, allowing the thoughts to be there but having the feeling that you're not involved in the conversation. It's almost like you're listening to a conversation among other people, but you're, just, you're not having any opinions. You just, you just watch. You allow them to have their conversation and you just stay there without any opinions. You just simply observe the thoughts. Keep very focused pay very strong attention, but it's like you're stepping out of the conversation. Allow the thoughts to come and allow the thoughts to go. Don't step into the conversation. That's the skill to cultivate. So simply watch your thoughts. To stay focused, don't space out. To stay sharp and focused and allow the thoughts to come and go. So now with this kind of steady mind, let's now imagine the Buddha of compassion in the sky, the embodiment of infinite compassion, infinite qualities, blissful, radiant, chen raising, if you can visualize, just imagine this energy in the sky. And we imagine white light going out from his heart, entering into the hearts of, of um, all the victims of all the pain and the suffering, the children, people being murdered, shot, people being harmed by others, all the victims of the suffering. 
completely healing their pain and all the people around the support the families and all the other people of all the suffering in the world of ukraine and the russians even the russian boys getting caught up in all this nightmare you know and the ukrainians nobody planned this it just suddenly happens these things out of the blue we don't know why because we have no view of karma the unbearable suffering of sentient beings all these humans just think about it this white light flooding into them healing every one of them purifying all their negativity purifying their suffering purifying their grief and their sadness and their anger you know all of them as we sing the mantra a few times oh mani pe So we just finished with this determination, you know, in the face of this unbearable suffering of this world. In the face of it, we think, you know, I must just keep going. I must just keep working on myself, developing more courage, more confidence, more kindness, less neurotic, less depressed, less angry, one step at a time, and just keep moving, no choice. And that gives us confidence. That attitude lifts us, you know. Just keep moving one day at a time, never giving up. Like in the in the four in this wonderful prayer of the Bodhisattvas, the four immeasurable thoughts. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings could abide in equanimity, free of ag anger, attachment, and ignorance. May they abide so. And then this brave attitude of the Bodhisattva: I will make this happen. Please, Lama Chenrezig, Buddha Chenrezig, bless me to be able to do this. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings could be free of suffering and its causes. May they be free. I will make this happen. Please, Buddha Chenrezig, bless me to be able to do this. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings could have happiness of enlightenment and its causes. May they have them. I will make this happen. Please, Buddha Chenrezig, bless me to be able to do this. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings were never parted from higher rebirths and liberations, excellent bliss. May they never be parted. I will make this happen. Please, Buddha Chenrezig, bless me to be able to do this. So that's it, sweethearts. Thank you, everybody. Just keep moving. Take care of ourselves and just keep moving. Okay. Much love, everybody. <laughs>